subject for the evening is James and John, the sons of Zebedee, also known as the sons of Thunder. Thunder, thunder, thunder. <laughs> so we'll take a look like we did last week. We'll see what we know about the brothers in general. And then take a look at James and John separately. And see if we can learn a little bit about them. Uh, they were part of a fishing business. That was their main claim to fame. That was owned by their father and based at Capernaum. And the only reason I think that it was owned by their father is when Jesus calls Peter and Andrew, James and John. They're called kind of in sequence. He goes by and calls Peter and Andrew, come, I'll make you fishers of men. And they went a little bit farther down, and he calls James and John. They were all working in the same vicinity. And when he calls Peter and Andrew, it just says they left their nets and followed him. When it gets to James and John, it says, uh, come follow me, and they left their nets and their father and followed Jesus. And it just to me that's just a a sense that maybe Peter and Andrew worked for Mr. Zebedee, that he was the owner of the thing. Another possible uh, explanation is that they the Zebedees seem to have been in a higher tax bracket. They were a little better connected than maybe some of the other disciples. And again this is just uh, hearsay. Just try and connect the dots. But look at John chapter 18. John chapter 18. And we're going to start in verse 15. This is as Jesus is going to trial in front of Annas and Caiaphas. It says, Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter inside. Okay. Uh, we assume that the reason that we don't get a name is that John's the one who's doing the writing. He refers to himself by... Uh, pseudonyms all the way through his gospel. He never talks about himself uh, as John did this, John did that. It's the disciple that Jesus loved. He'll call himself that. Uh, the other disciple sometimes is what he calls himself. But go over to uh, chapter 19. And there is an, a, a passage about he and Peter. Uh, that can't be right. Hang on a minute. Yeah, 1925. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. And we've always understood that we're talking about John. Right? It's just he refers to himself in other ways. Look at chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they've put him. So we have... In chapter 18, the other disciple. In 19, the disciple that Jesus loved. And in 20, the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. So if you kind of just put all those little pieces together, uh, we think that it's John in all of these situations. Which means that it was John who was able to get him into the high priest's palace. Why would that be? Well, maybe they supplied the fish for the high priest residence. And John was the guy who was used to taking the fish and making the delivery. Peter, as an employee, would have been involved, but not at that high a level. He wasn't the family member to take the fish. So John would take the fish. He's known to the high priest. Peter, on the other hand, has to wait outside because he's an unknown entity. So again, it's a guess, but uh, it's at least a possibility. 
We find out a little bit later that James and John may have been used to getting their way. Uh, they were a little bit more full of themselves at times than the rest of the disciples could stomach. They caused a little bit of problem within the group because they were kind of social climbers. They wanted to have the, the best seats. They wanted to be the most involved. So we'll look at that here in a little bit. But here's four men, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, all called about the same time. And they have four different levels of connection to Jesus. Andrew is the outsider. Uh, he's not really connected closely in a lot of passages with Jesus. He's around, but he's not one of the big three. And then you have James, who is part of the three that get to go to the Mount of Transfiguration. They're the closest to Jesus when he's praying in the garden, those special occasions. But he's still not as well known as Peter and John. Then, of course, you have John, who may well have been Jesus' best friend, probably his cousin. We think that his mother, Salome, and Mary were sisters. So John and James are related to Jesus, but John and Jesus are much closer. He's also the only disciple, probably, that died of old age or died of a natural death. The rest of them, we think, all of the, the rest were martyred in some way. And then, of course, you have Peter, who's the apostle to the Jews, carrier of the keys, etc. But he's not the disciple that Jesus loved. Peter is extremely important, but John has an identity that is different from the other 11. He has a closeness to Jesus that's different. We'll look at that a little bit here in a minute as well. Uh, so what do we know about James individually? Uh, he with John seemed to have been very connected to Jesus' power and authority. They liked being in a position where they could be raised up socially. Let's look at a, a couple of passages. It happens more than once. Uh, Luke chapter 9. Beginning in verse 46. Luke 9. Verse 46. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. And he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is the least among you who will be the greatest. So uh, there's this kind of one-upsmanship among the disciples. Part of the problem was James and John. Right? One more real quick that's just uh, right here. Uh, Master said, John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. Whoever is not against you is for you. So here's John trying to you know, kind of take the reins of control and decide who's in and who's out. And Jesus says, well, they're not hurting our ministry by what they're doing. Why are you trying to oppose them? Allow them to do uh, what they're doing. So again, John's used to kind of representing the company and making decisions and being in, on the top. Uh, the disciples are having conversations about which one of us is in charge here. And John's making decisions and then telling Jesus about it after he's already finished making the decision. There's more. As the, this is verse 51. Just keep going. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And then he and, his, he and his disciples went to another town. So James and John, sons of thunder, right? I've never been completely sure whether sons of thunder was a reference to them being this brash, 
that Jesus just looked at them and thought, man alive, you know, these guys are just thunderous. Or whether there was something about their daddy. You know, maybe Zebedee was a thunderous guy. And Jesus met Zebedee and said, well, you two, you know, you're sons of the thunder. So, uh, not sure whether he's referring to them or to their daddy, but uh, they certainly fit the bill there. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. Well, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit at my right or on my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those to whom they have been prepared or for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. So Jesus calls them together. And he says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. So we're having little infightings among the apostles, and part of the reason for these infightings is James and John who are wanting to be large and in charge. They're wanting to kind of climb the, the ladder, the association ladder, and be up on top. Uh, look at Matthew 20. Matthew 20, starting in verse 20. If it doesn't work to ask him yourself, get his aunt Salome to come talk to him. The mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it that you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in the kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right hand or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. So parallel passages, but Matthew says it wasn't just James and John. It was James and John's mama that came and talked to him. So if you're raised as Mary's little boy and Aunt Salome comes over or you meet somewhere, you see each other, and there's James and John, your cousin. If this is a family thing, how tough is it? to have Aunt Salome come and say, now Jesus, here's what we want, and try to talk you into letting the boys be tough. So again, I think the Zebedee family, that clan, was different. I think that they uh, had some money. I think they had some clout. I think they were kind of used to having things go the way they thought they should go. And then Jesus calls the, the brothers and puts them in a group of 12 and says, we're all going to be working together and I want you to be part of this. And it's a difficult thing for James and John. And when you get toward the end of John's life, uh, he, he's known not as a son of thunder, but as the apostle of love. Right? When you read his gospel and his other writings, he writes a lot about love. There's an old uh, legend that when... John was very old living in Ephesus that he was in a group of Christians and just having him there was you know great honor for them to be there for him to be there and they asked him if there was anything he wanted to share with the group and he was very aged and kind of slow but he got up from his place and he walked up so he could be seen by everybody he went up to the front of the assembly and he said uh, little children love each other he went back, sat back down. So I don't know if it's a true story or not a true story, but it's, it's a whole lot like John. Uh, the one important thing to him by the time he was an old man was, I want you folks to love each other. I want you to be obedient. I want you to pay attention to the law of Christ. I want you to love each other. If you don't do anything else, then those things are the most important. Uh, as far as their deaths are concerned, James is the earliest and John is the latest. 
Uh, James dies probably around 11 years after the uh, church begins. It's recorded in Acts chapter 12. Uh, and, it, and it's kind of a sidelight. It's, there's not a lot of information. Uh, Herod was ramping up the persecution against the church. And he got James and killed him with the sword. And so probably beheaded, maybe run through. Anyway, James gets killed. And then there's a story right behind it where Peter gets arrested and put in prison. But if you remember, the angel comes and wakes him up and sets him free. And Peter leaves town for a while. He, he moves out of Jerusalem for a little while. But Herod is persecuting and one of the biggest feathers in his cap was killing James, the brother of John. But John lives until almost the turn of the century, maybe as late as the late 90s in the first century. So uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of information about James, but John is the opposite. He's kind of like Peter. There's more stuff about John than we would have time to talk about. So we're going to hit a few highlights, things that we know of that he did, or at least things that I think are interesting that touch my heart anyway. Uh, John is, or he refers to himself as the apostle that Jesus loves. He asked Jesus if he could sit on Jesus' right or on his left. We have one example very specifically of this kind of happening. At the Last Supper, uh, eating Oriental style, there would have been a, a low table kind of down on the floor. You reclined on your left elbow, and you ate with your right hand, right? So you'd, you'd have almost a wagon wheel effect of feet coming out from the table all the way around. John was sitting immediately, or was laying immediately, to Jesus' right. We know that because when they're asking who it was that was going to betray him, Lazarus is reclining against Jesus. He has his head like over on the chest of God in the flesh. That's always been the most amazing picture to me, that this guy, a uh, fisherman from Galilee, right, grew up, Bethsaida, Capernaum, small town guy. He's a nobody until Jesus, and he's actually laying, reclining over against Jesus after supper. I mean, just an amazing picture to me. So, he kind of gets his wish, at least as far as that's concerned, that he's on Jesus' right hand. Uh, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, he points out his mother. He points out, John, you take care of my mother. How important is somebody in your life if that's one of your final requests? It's not the very last thing Jesus says from the cross, but it is his final request. Right? Father, forgive them. Uh, it, it doesn't really make a request as far as the thief is concerned, but today you'll be with me in paradise. And son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. And she went and lived with John. Jesus had four brothers that we know of. John gets custody of Mary and takes care of her. So we assume that Joseph is gone. We know that his brothers didn't believe in him prior to the resurrection. But after the resurrection, James, his baby brother, becomes very important in the church in Jerusalem. But as far as I know, Mary stayed with John, moved to Ephesus, uh, was part of that community during the latter years of her life. So, you know, how much of a relationship uh, did they have? Um, he's seen with Peter on several occasions. Sometimes he's active in what he's doing. The two of them do something together. Sometimes it's just Peter and John were doing something, and then Peter does all the talking, and we just know John is there. I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Uh, when they healed the guy at the uh, gate beautiful, right? the lame guy, and Peter says, look at us. And so he looks at Peter, and Peter says, well, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus get up and walk. Well, it was Peter and John. They were going together because it was the time of prayer. And they were going up to the temple together. They run into this guy. 
And they heal him. Peter heals him. And John's just kind of there. Immediately after that, they get called in before the Sanhedrin who want an explanation of who they are and why they think they have the right to heal people and all that sort of thing. Uh, and so Peter does the talking in front of the Sanhedrin, but they're impressed with both of the men. So whether John says some things that aren't recorded, don't know. Now look at Acts chapter 4. Acts 4, 18. They called the men again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. So it's a, it's a tag team match. Right? It's not Peter speaking on John's behalf. It's, it's almost as if they were in unison. They're at least in unison of spirit talking about how they're not going to stop doing what God has given them the opportunity to do. Uh, when you see them in Samaria, remember Philip goes, preaches in Samaria. You have a bunch of people baptized, and it says they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus, but they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John travel to Samaria and lay hands on the folks, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And put two and two together here's John going back to Samaria after he didn't get permission to firebomb them because they didn't fix him a bedroom and now he goes back and lays hands on them and they receive the Holy Spirit So, and I think it would be hilarious if it was the same town where they were but uh, that, that might be pushing it too far uh, look at Galatians 2 Galatians chapter 2 verse 9 this is Paul's discussion of his early ministry and getting to know the apostles in Jerusalem uh, the fact that he didn't learn the gospel from them but he got it straight from Jesus okay. uh, chapter 2 verse 9 um, uh, James Cephas and John those esteemed as pillars gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles as they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. So we've got listed here James, Cephas, and John. Who is Cephas? That's Peter, right? Who is this James? This is not John's brother James. He's already dead. This is James, the brother of Jesus, probably. It could be James, the son of Alphaeus. We lose him altogether. I mean, he, we, we don't have much scripture on James, the son of Alphaeus at all. But we have a James. And it says that because they were kind of the, the pillars of the congregation, those that were esteemed to be uh, uh, the strength of the congregation that's why I think it was probably James the Lord's brother so uh, that's all we have as far as scriptural things well I guess there's one more at the end of John when Jesus talks to Peter about how he will die you know, when you were young you dressed yourself and you went wherever you wanted to go but when you're old somewhere else will dress you and take you somewhere you don't want to go talking about how Peter would die as uh, how he would be martyred uh, and Peter sees John standing there and says well, what about him and Jesus says well if I want him to stay until I come back what's that to you and John writes about it and so John at the very end of his own gospel says now a rumor started that that apostle never would die but he didn't say he was going to stay alive until he got back he said what if so he, he has to explain the his own rumor at the end of his gospel but here's a list of things that he wrote uh, that that we enjoy right obviously the gospel it stands alone it was written later than the other gospels it's not like matthew mark and luke uh, 
very different. In some ways, it's a more useful gospel. If you really like lists and you like, you know, for things to be in a very orderly fashion, John tries to give us, you know, seven miracles, seven I am statements. He's more organized as far as the way he presents the material sometimes. Um, then we have 1 John, which is a circular letter. Peter wrote to pretty much the same group. James may have written to a similar group. Uh, these are Jews that have been run out of town because of their faith. So John writes a letter to them as one of their pastors, as one of their leaders. Peter writes to them. James writes to them all for the same reason. But John's circular letter is all about love and obedience. Love each other. Be obedient. Here's the thing you need to be obedient to the most. Love each other. And it, he almost gets in this circular reasoning over about chapter 4. You know, that, that here's a, here's a, a, a command that's new, but it's not new. It's the same old command, but now I'm going to tell you again, love each other. So follow the commands that I'm giving you. Love each other. If you keep his commands, then you really belong to him. And what's the command? Love, love each other. So he just keeps, he gets on that roller coaster and just the merry-go-round just keeps going around. Second uh, John is a personal letter, uh, but it's addressed to the, the precious lady. And if the precious lady is a church, it may be a circular, but it seems to be to an individual, a particular uh, person, or maybe to a particular congregation. And then third John is very personal. Uh, he has some folks that he cares about that he wants to, uh, to talk to, and so he sends them a letter. And we have all those. And some of John's letters, his second and third John, are almost like just reading somebody else's mail. But we can gather, we can glean from the things that he says to the other people. And then, of course, finally, Revelation, which is a whole world unto itself. Uh, tell you something about the Revelation that maybe you haven't thought about. It has five tiers to it before the information comes to us. Okay? It says that this is the information that God gave to Jesus. Jesus gives the information to angels. The angels give the information to John. John sends the information to the seven churches of Asia, and the angels of the churches of, the, of Asia read it out loud to the congregations. So it takes five levels just to get it to the original congregations. Then it has to be copied, recopied, you know, finally makes its way into Scripture. So we're at least the sixth generation getting all of the, the things that God wanted that group of people to have. But God to Jesus, Jesus to the angel, the angel to John, John to the church, uh, the angel of the church or the reader of the church delivers it to the group in some kind of public reading. Um, I've always wondered what it would be like to hear Scripture the first time. Mm -hmm. right? straight, straight out of the scroll, just broke the seal. Somebody stands up in the group and says, we have a letter from John. Hey, we love John. Okay, tell us what John has to say. Well, John says that he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, and he saw this figure, and he heard this sound, and from there on, I can imagine their eyes just getting bigger and bigger and bigger as John was reading to them from that original scroll of the Revelation. Uh, and then, whoever got it first, it would have been their job to copy it all down and send it to the next congregation. So, you know, if the church at Ephesus gets it first, then they've got to write it down, send it to Smyrna, and Smyrna write it down, send it to Thyatira, so it can make its way through there. Uh, it would be an amazing journey for that, uh, for that information. Any questions or thoughts about John? What have I missed? <laughs>